Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's lunch hour lecture. I'm Jack Ashby from UCL Culture, and I'm here to, to host you today and to welcome our speaker, Dr. Nick Witham, who is a lecturer in US political history in the Institute of Americas here at UCL. Uh, Nick is associate editor of the Journal of American Studies. He's on the uh, executive committee of the British Association for American Studies, and they um, awarded him uh, for his 2015 book, The Cultural Left and the Reagan Era, the Arthur Miller Award for the best first book in American studies. And the fact that I've just said American studies many times in 30 seconds <laughs> demonstrates that he is the perfect, perfect person to uh, give us today's talk. The US presidential election, a post-mortem. Please jo wel uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Nick Witham. Thank you, Jack. Um, and it's so good to see so many people here interested in the results of the American election, even if those results might have been quite worrying for many of you. Um, so the results are in of the election, or they're almost in. There are still some votes being counted in various states. Um, but there are, there are certain concrete things we can say. In the popular vote, i.e. the total number of votes cast throughout the United States, the nominee of the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton, beat the Republican Party candidate, Donald Trump. As I said, the final tally of votes has not yet been confirmed, um, and Clinton's margin of victory is actually likely to be higher than that on the image behind me, which I captured on Sunday. Um, the New York Times has reported that her margin could be in the region of 1.5 to 2 million votes, or 1.5 percentage points that she won the popular vote by. However, in the much more important electoral college vote, which calculates winner-takes-all results in the individual states and weights their impact for population size, Trump was able to eke out a victory by winning narrow margins in so-called swing states, such as Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, all of which were clinched by less than 4%, and in the case of Michigan, by less than half a percentage point. And it was Michigan um, that I think a lot of people sat up worryingly watching uh, in the middle of the night in the UK last Tuesday. So this is only the fifth time in American history that an election has been won by a candidate who did not also win the popular vote. It was therefore a very tight contest that was fascinatingly close or depressingly close, depending on the way that you look at the results. And if the outcomes in a handful of states had been slightly different, I would be giving you a very different lecture this afternoon. And in fact, I really should admit from the outset that last week's results forced me to return to a blank page with this talk. Um, <laughs> I had already started to prepare uh, a lecture based on the assumption that Clinton would win. Um, and that became clear over the course of Tuesday night and Wednesday morning that, that I was going to have to rethink quite considerably. So in spite of this, this really close result, uh, I think this election tells us a lot about the state of United States politics today and draws certain themes into very sharp relief. Put simply, Trump's victory forces us to reckon with some very unpleasant features of the American political and social landscape that may have been easier to ignore had Clinton emerged from this election victorious. To help explain some of these features, there are three questions that I'd like to discuss with you today, and, and by the time I'm finished, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. The first of these questions is, how should we explain Trump's success? The second is, what were the problems of Clinton's candidacy? And finally, what broader points should we carry forward from the results as we look at American politics over the course of the next four years and try and make some predictions about what may or may not happen? So the first question is to think about Trump's success. How should we explain the success of Donald Trump, a candidate who so many experts thought was such an incredibly unlikely um, possible president. The campaign slogan, Make America Great Again, struck an important chord, I think, with Trump voters. To large swathes of the population who felt unrepresented by the American political system, it suggested that a return was possible to a political situation before globalization, before multiculturalism, and before political correctness in which ordinary Americans, read white Americans, were able to speak their mind and feel as though the United States belonged to them. To drill down a little further from this campaign rhetoric of, of Make America Great Again, though, I think we must first think about the important impact 
of economic alienation as a key structural issue leading to Trump's success. The global turbulence experienced in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis has particularly impacted the Rust Belt states in the Midwest of the United States, such as Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Ohio and Iowa. Trump drew votes in these states from workers who did not benefit from the economic recovery forced into being by the Obama administration. They've seen their wages and standards of living stagnate and harbor painful memories of the trade deal signed during the 1990s by Hillary Clinton's husband, Bill Clinton, of course, that led industrial and manufacturing jobs to move overseas. However, we need to take economics seriously, but it does not explain all or even, I think, most of Donald Trump's success. Ethno-nationalism was also vitally important. Trump emerged as a candidate riding a wave of birtherism, which questioned the legitimacy of President Obama by suggesting that he had been born outside of the United States. Um, and Trump really came to prominence um, by suggesting this over and over again um, during Obama's first and second terms that Obama had not been born in the United States and was therefore an illegitimate president. On the campaign trail, Trump also picked fights with Latino Americans by smearing immigrants as murderers and rapists and promising to build a glorious wall on the southern US border that, would force Mexico, that he would force Mexico to pay for. He promised a ban on Muslims entering the United States, refused to entertain the idea of providing sanctuary for refugees from the Syrian civil war, and picked a seemingly unwinnable public fight with the parents of a Pakistani-American US Army captain killed in Iraq. In emphasizing the fault lines between white Americans and these ethnic others, Trump was able to politicize the question of immigration and national identity much more successfully than any Republican candidate before him. But old-fashioned American racism also played a key role in Trump's popularity. Ever since the ultra-conservative Tea Party wing of the Republican Party emerged during the 2010 midterm elections, it has been clear that opposition to the presidency of Barack Obama has been based, in part at least, on his identity as an African-American. The rise of the Black Lives Matter movement in response to the killing of numerous young black men at the hands of America's police forces has also played a role. Trump embraced the All Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter movements, referring to all Americans and, and, and policemen in particular. These were counter movements and he embraced them and in, and in embracing them was endorsed by numerous white supremacists during the course of the election campaign, most notably the former Ku Klux Klan grand wizard David Duke. Come January then, when Trump enters the White House officially, these ugly forces will have a figurehead at the center of um, the American political system, however much Trump protests that he has not courted the support of white supremacists. Um, and this was, a, this was a key debate during the campaign as, as to whether Trump would, um, would reject the endorsement of David Duke um, and white supremacists, and, 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 and Trump and his running mate Mike Pence were very reluctant to do so. So when we think about economic alienation, when we think about ethno-nationalism, when we think about American racism, we should also not forget the vital role in Trump's campaign played by the theme of misogyny. When Trump referred to Clinton during the third presidential debate as such a nasty woman, I'm not going to try and do Trump's accent, you'll be pleased to know, as such a nasty woman, his comment, dripping with condescension and privilege, only marked the tip of the iceberg in his campaign's mobilization of gendered rhetoric. Clinton was consistently portrayed by her opponents as lacking in stamina, as shrill, and other such shorthands essentially for too female to lead. Male and female Trump supporters were photographed wearing t-shirts at his rallies with such misogynistic slogans as Trump that bitch and Hillary sucks but not like Monica. <laughs> but most significant for our understanding of the campaign were the allegations of sexual assault leveled at Trump during its closing stages. Dozens of women came forward, emboldened by the release of accidentally filmed footage from 2005 of the Republican candidate bragging about such behavior, um, such behavior as um, sexual harassment, um, with radio and TV host Billy Bush. Trump defended his comments uh, in one of the campaign um, debates 
as locker room talk, and it appears that many voters, including considerable numbers of women, well, white women, um, were inclined to agree with him that this type of behavior does not render him unfit for office. So I think all of these factors come together and gave Trump the allure of outsider status. He painted himself as someone who was removed from the political system, a maverick who could tell it like it is, a rich, uncorrupted businessman whose skills could improve the American brand by fighting back against the economic might of China. This clearly appealed to voters. Trump's popularity was also amplified by Clinton's characterization of his supporters as a basket full of deplorables, a term that was willingly and enthusiastically adopted by those whose hatred of Clinton was palpable. So economic alienation, ethno-nationalism, racism, and misogyny were therefore key building blocks for, the, for Trump and his supporters. And were, I think, and we have to reckon with, precisely what made him important, uh, him made him popular. Voters did not quietly or reticently vote for Trump in spite of these bigoted characteristics. Instead, they actively embraced his candidacy because of them. In this sense, then, Trump's supporters are, I think, quite unlike the shy Tories or shy Brexiteers that we hear so much about in the UK. They embraced Trump's campaign, often loudly and proudly, while the pundit class failed to recognize the stunning electoral power they would wield. So those are some ways of thinking about Trump's successes. But I think it's also important for us to consider the problems of Clinton's candidacy. So Hillary Clinton was the Democratic Party establishment's choice as nominee, and in this sense her selection demonstrated a perhaps undue deference to party hierarchies. She was challenged in the primaries by Bernie Sanders, and thus pushed to the left on certain issues. I'm gonna say more about Bernie Sanders in a second. Um, but in reality, her campaign was built on arguments for continuity with the Obama administration, of which she'd been a part as Secretary of State, the breaking of the glass ceiling that had present, prevented um, a, a woman becoming President of the United States or even running as the nominee of a major political party, and the lingering memory of economic prosperity during her husband's second term in the late 1990s. Clinton's insider status therefore gave her opponents the ability to brand her as crooked, to focus on her misuse of a private email server during her time as Secretary of State, and to have these attacks stick and to have them seem as the equivalent of the attacks against Trump's racism, bigotry, and misogyny. But as I said, we must also recognize the significance of the Sanders insurgency against Clinton's nomination. Bernie Sanders, the independent senator from Vermont and a lifelong socialist, ran Clinton much closer in the primaries than most observers predicted. His proud boast that his campaign ignored the funding of super PACs, which are political action committees with no restrictions on donations from individuals, and was based on small campaign contributions averaging $27 a piece from ordinary Americans, meant that Sanders appeared as the antithesis of Clinton, the establishment candidate. In, during his campaign, Sanders drew attention to the widening gaps in income inequality throughout the United States and sought to propose a progressive alternative to mainstream democratic politics. In doing so, he drew the support of millions of young Americans, progressives, and certain groups of working class Democrats, although notably not African Americans. And I want to be clear here, I'm doubtful that Sanders would have been a more successful candidate than Clinton in a general election against Donald Trump. And when I discussed that question with some of my students last week in the immediate aftermath of the election, that, that view proved unpopular with them, and so it might be something to discuss uh, in the Q&A. But I really don't think Sanders would have been a more successful candidate than Clinton. His avowed socialism would have given rise, I think, to red baiting within the Republican Party and the right-wing media that would have crippled him with undecided voters. His Jewishness may also have played a factor, given the, ca the Trump campaign's willingness to court the votes of disaffected whites via ethno-nationalism and allusions to old-fashioned racism. However, with the benefit of hindsight, it is clear that the successes of Sanders during the primary season highlight Clinton's weakness and help to explain a lack of enthusiasm for her candidacy amongst Democratic constituencies and undecided voters. 
To demonstrate this fact, we need this fact, we need only to look to Sanders' unexpected primary victories in those vitally important swing states of Wisconsin and Michigan, which helped to highlight Clinton's lack of popularity in the Rust Belt. And just to put this in context and to highlight the kind of failure of, um, of data journalism and, and the predictive powers of, of, of journalists, um, the night before the Michigan primary uh, between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, pollsters were predicting that, that Hillary Clinton would win this by 20, 22, 25 percentage points, and Bernie Sanders ended up winning a slim victory. Uh, and when we think about how hard it was to predict the outcome of the presidential election um, in the Midwest, in states like Wisconsin, I think that does demonstrate how significant Sanders' challenge to Clinton was. The Clinton campaign also chose to rely on character and fitness for office, rather than more specific and detailed campaign issues. It became clear early on that Clinton would rely on appeals to the rationality of the American people to beat Trump, rather than making a positive case based in the issues. This involved asking voters whether it was a good idea to put the Republican candidate in charge of the nuclear codes, as well as drawing repeated attention to his attitudes towards women. This prevented Clinton, I think, from discussing her mastery of policy issues and deep experience as a politician and a diplomat. In this sense, her campaign can be, pair, can, can be compared to the 1964 presidential election, in which sitting President Lyndon Johnson questioned the sanity and suitability for office of his Republican opponent, Barry Goldwater. And in 1964, for Johnson, this was an incredibly successful strategy, um, and Johnson won a landslide victory. But this strategy did not work for Hillary Clinton. And in this sense, I think a better comparison point might be the recent Brexit vote in the United Kingdom, in which the Remain campaign warned the British people that leaving the EU would be a disaster. But a slim majority suggested that they didn't care about these warnings, and the intensity of their anti-EU emotions carried the day. In making these points, we must also realize the enormous difficulties Clinton faced that were not completely of her own making. The decades-long campaign against her and her husband by conservative pundits, the billions of dollars of free media coverage afforded to Trump's controversialist outpourings uh, by TV news shows, and in this sense, he really was a, a kind of reality TV candidate, and the, and the intervention by FBI Director James Comey only 11 days before the election, in which he announced a new investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. However, Clinton was an establishment figure in an inhospitable political climate for establishment figures. She was challenged by a populist insurgency from the left during the primary season and was unable to confront Trump on the terrain of concrete issues, instead relying on criticisms of his fitness for office. It therefore seems difficult not to conclude that Clinton was a deeply flawed candidate for the 2016 election cycle. So the final section of my talk uh, this afternoon involves asking the question, what are some broader points that we can carry forward from these results? Um, what are some things to look out for in, in the next four years, and how, how will academics working on the history and politics of the modern United States um, think about this election result in the coming years? So the first question re relates to the Voting Rights Act, which was a piece of legislation passed in 1965 by President Lyndon Johnson in response to the African-American Civil Rights Movement. The Voting Rights Act established provisions to overcome legal barriers at the state and local levels that prevented African Americans from exercising their right to vote, such as literacy tests and poll taxes. And when I explain this to my students, I always say that you know, literacy tests um, seems like a, a really um, ridiculous uh, description for a test that asked African Americans before they were able to register to vote to recite the entire American Constitution, and if they were unable to do so, then they wouldn't be allowed to vote. Um, you know, these were seriously problematic efforts to bar African Americans from voting. This legislation, uh, the Voting Rights Act, was primarily focused on southern states that had systematically denied African Americans and other racial minorities their right to vote as part of a system of white supremacy uh, in, the su in the southern United States um, that had, uh, had existed since almost the end of the Civil War in the mid-19th century. The law, the Voting Rights Act, was successful in providing the opportunity for black Americans to register to vote in the South. Uh, it enfranchised millions and eventually led to the election of the nation's first African-American president. As the journalist Ari Berman has highlighted in his brilliant work on this topic, the Voting Rights Act is now 
fundamentally under attack in the United States. In states such as Pennsylvania, Texas, and North Carolina, Republican politicians have passed measures making it harder to vote. These measures mandate that voters present government-issued IDs at their polling places. They make it harder to get access to these IDs. And in some cases, they have closed polling stations in districts with significant minority populations. The 2016 election was therefore the first election since 1965 in which voters did not benefit from the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. So what impact did this have? I promise I haven't just gone off on a historical tangent. Um, it's hard to say with any certainty at this stage exactly what impact um, this rolling back of the Voting Rights Act in certain states has had. But in swing states, such as North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, African-American turnout was down, leading Clinton to struggle to match the share of the black vote garnered by Obama in 2008 and 2012. In part, of course, this can be explained by the existence of what uh, pundits have referred to as an enthusiasm gap between the two candidates, with voters much less um, inspired by Clinton than they were by Obama. But I think we must also take seriously the idea that low turnout, which might have swung the election in Trump's favor, was also the result of voter suppression. Whilst there are numerous aspects of the American electoral system that appear complex and undemocratic, then this sign of a return to the dark days of minority disenfranchisement is perhaps the most troubling. Looking forwards to the next four years, I think we also need to ask whether this is a governing moment for the Republicans. In other words, does the Republican Party have enough power to consolidate its legislative agenda and change America? My answer here is a, is a cautious yes. It is impossible to know how effectively Trump will work with the Republican Party establishment to develop legislation. However, come January, the Republicans will control the White House. They will also have a majority in both the House of Representatives and in the Senate, the two legislative chambers in the US Congress. Donald Trump will be able to appoint a new Supreme Court justice to sit in the seat vacated by the death of Antonin Scalia in February of this year. Uh, and, and he will be able to nominate um, that Supreme Court justice because Republican senators successfully blocked Obama's nomination of the moderate judge Merrick Garland. The Republicans will also control 34 state governorships in comparison to the Democrats' 15. The national balance of power will therefore lie solidly with the Republicans. The likely priorities of a Trump administration will be the repeal of Obamacare, the president's landmark health care reforms, the mass deportation of illegal immigrants, the rewriting of US trade policy to impose tariffs and back away from free trade agreements, and the appointment of an anti-abortion, anti-gun control Supreme Court justice to replace Scalia. Trump will also be in a strong position to repeal dozens of executive orders signed by Obama on issues as diverse as the gradual closure of Guantanamo Bay, America's signature of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and rules allowing transgender students in schools and colleges to decide for themselves which bathrooms to use. Given the national balance of power, it will be difficult for the Democrats to resist these developments as long as Trump is able to clearly and coherently transform his campaign rhetoric into legislative action. Whilst this clarity and coherence on Trump's part is by no means guaranteed, we should expect that the Trump administration will make significant headway during the course of its first years in office. Given this context then, what next for the Democrats? With each election cycle, the American population is becoming steadily more diverse and the US is edging towards majority-minority status in which non-whites will make up more of the population than whites. For some time now, the argument has been made that demographics is destiny for the Democrats and that the changing identity of the American electorate will lead the Democratic Party to having a lock on future presidential elections. That as more and more African Americans, Latino Americans, Asian Americans are voting, they're likely to vote Democrat, that that will play into the hands of the, uh, of the Democrats. The 2016 results cast considerable doubt on this thesis, at least in the short term. Whilst Clinton expanded Obama's share of the vote in solidly Democratic states, such as California, and also solidly Republican states, like Texas, and this, I think, in part is what explains her considerable popular vote lead. She was able to expand her share of the vote in these states that, that frankly, didn't really matter that much. She was always going to either win them or lose them. 
Um, these gains, as I've said, did not o affect the overall outcome of the election. Instead, what mattered most was that Trump was able to garner support from all white demographics, with the exception of college-educated white women. So the majority of everyone in white demographics, apart from college-educated white women, voted for Donald Trump. White voters then, and in particular white voters in the Midwestern swing states, were crucial to the outcome of the 2016 race. The next four years will undoubtedly see considerable amounts of soul-searching amongst Democrats about how to reach out to these communities. One answer will be a renewed economic populism led by Bernie, the Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren wing of the party. And Warren is a Democratic senator from Massachusetts and another hero to those support, who supported Sanders in the primaries. But if this approach comes at the expense of the anti-racist, anti-sexist planks of, the democratic, of democratic policy that have been built into the party's approach since the 1960s, it will risk further alienating minority voters. In a context where the Republicans control the national political scene and are the dominant force in the majority of the individual states, the Democrats are now, frankly, stuck between a rock and a hard place and need to look beyond the possibility that by 2020, Donald Trump will have proved himself unelectable. So just to bring my talk to conclusion, um, I think it's important that we remind ourselves of the fact that Donald Trump ran an authoritarian election campaign. He threatened to jail his opponent if he was victorious, and he threatened to reject the legitimacy of the result if he was defeated. Given this authoritarianism, Trump's suggestion in recent days that the protests that have erupted in cities and on college campuses across the United States are part of a media conspiracy is very worrying. Furthermore, given his campaign's recourse to ethno-nationalism and racism, it is deeply concerning that he has decided to appoint as his chief strategist, Stephen Bannon, Bannon is a white nationalist, anti-Semitic businessman, who is head of Breitbart News, a far-right website that serves as the beating heart of the ultra-conservative alt-right movement. In this respect, at least, it appears that as though Trump will remain committed to the spirit of his election campaign. Given these deeply distressing developments, I'm reminded of words spoken by Richard Hofstadter, one of America's most eminent historians, in 1968, amidst similar political and social turmoil in the United States. Hofstadter argued that the very possibility of civilized human discourse rests upon the willingness of people to consider that they may be mistaken, and that the possibility of modern democracy rests upon the willingness of governments to accept the existence of loyal opposition, organized to reverse some of their policies, and to replace them in office. Both parties, I think, need to take heed of these words in the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election. The Democrats need to come to terms with the mistakes that were made during the campaign and to develop a strategy for confronting the Trump administration over the course of the next four years. The Republicans, on the other hand, need to recognize the thinness of their electoral mandate, as well as the Trump campaign's contribution to the fragility of civilized political discourse in the US today. Ultimately, if Trump and his supporters imagined themselves as loyal and patriotic, as a loyal and patriotic opposition during the Obama presidency, they should not question the legitimacy of those who seek to protest during their time in power. But of course, they will call into question protesters' right to free speech. And I expect them to do so in ever more outlandish and controversial ways. For us, then, as observers on this side of the Atlantic, what is important is that we do not normalize Trump. He is not just another American presidential candidate. His bigoted rhetoric and his short-sighted policies should be called out for what they are and challenged wherever possible. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Nick, for a, a frank and, and thought-provoking talk. We, we do have time for questions. Um, you can either raise your hand, and I'm sure we've got quite a few questions, so if I can ask you to keep them short, and perhaps, Nick, if you could keep your answers short, too. Um, but you can also put questions to this website on Slido using the code 9431 if you're watching online or if you're in the room. Um, so we have a question up here with the microphone. Hi. Um, I think earlier you said that Sanders wasn't as wasn't popular with African American voters, and I wonder if you could speak a bit more about that. And did you mean that he Clinton was more popular with them? 
Um, and I also noted that I think the turnout was only about 50% of the population. Mm. Um, so I wondered if you could explain a little bit why it was so low. Yes, yeah. two good questions. Um, Bernie Sanders certainly struggled with African-American voters in um, the primaries. Both candidates were challenged by the Black Lives Matter movement, um, who went to campaign rallies for both Clinton and Sanders and, 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 and sought to um, you know, ask very serious questions about their attitudes towards American racism and, and police brutality. Um, neither candidate was brilliant at addressing those, um, those concerns. But Hillary Clinton um, was able in, um, in the south of the United States during the course of the primaries to, um, to, to, to win significant numbers of, of African-American voters. I think in part because of the legacy of her husband's administration, and this is not unproblematic. Um, Clinton was president during the era of um, the beginning of the war on drugs. Um, the, the beginnings of, oh, the, he, he oversaw expansion of mass incarceration, which both of these policies impacted African-Americans significantly. But Clinton is often referred to in the popular imagination as the first African-American president. Uh, you know, he, not anymore now that we have had an African-American president, but when he was in the White House, um, this idea that he was a, a liberal Southern Democrat, he could play the saxophone, uh, he was at ease with African-American voters, was something that garnered him popularity. Um, and, 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 and retained a, retained a kind of um, a hangover, no matter how simplistic those explanations seem. And, um, and so, and Sanders was, was, he struggled, essentially, to engage with the, with the rhetoric of Black Lives Matter more so than Clinton. Um, I think on the, on the question of turnout, um, you're right, and this is a broader question that I don't have brilliant answers to, um, that political scientists probably would be better at answering than me, a historian, but you know, turnout in, um, in the United States is, is incredibly low. Um, neither of these candidates infused Americans, I think it's fair to say. Um, often, um, when we hear pundits writing about conversations they've had with American voters, they talked about the fact that they didn't really want to vote for either of the candidates. Um, some went and voted for, for third party candidates, but usually I think the answer was to, to vote for one or the other, Trump or Clinton, Holding, holding one's nose, uh, to use a very British way of describing that. And so I think that that explains to some extent why turnout was, was, was so low. The one just in front of you. Thanks. And then. Um, if one accepts or looks at Trump as non-ideological in the sense that his ideas flip and we don't know quite direction in which direction he's going, um, do you think that the power struggles but among the people um, that, um, that he chooses uh, will fill a vacuum and incapacitate him? Um, I mean, I, that is one possibility. What I suspect is that um, you're right that Trump is non is, is to some extent un or non-ideological, although I wouldn't push that too far. One of the first things he said in his, in his victory speech on Tuesday, last Tuesday night, was um, that one of the first priorities of his presidency was going to be um, an enormous in investment in infrastructure around the country. Um, and if we think about um, libertarian, conservative American politicians who don't like government spending, who don't like high taxes, that, that doesn't ring true. That, the idea that the government would go and spend lots of money on infrastructure doesn't ring true. With that, with that conservative view of the economy. So in that sense, I think you're right. Donald Trump is non-ideological to the extent that he doesn't subscribe to every single one of the Republican Party's um, kind of articles of faith. But I think to the extent that he has tapped into um, you know, those, those themes that I highlighted, ethno-nationalism, um, racism, misogyny, I think, um, and, and, and you know, a conservative view of gender politics, I think he, he is hitting some of the, the Republicans' articles of faith. And in that sense, he is ideological. Um, and so I'm not convinced that his, his flip-flopping or his lack of ideological coherence will be his downfall. Um, I suspect that what he's going to be able to do is, is quite successfully marshal the rhetoric of ethno-nationalism and racism, even whilst he's not able to put those ideas into really strong action, because my suspicion is that more moderate Republicans, although there are not many of those left, will, will, will stop him from, from doing that. Thank you. I have more of a point, and 
this is that um, c citing uh, David Duke's allegiance to Trump without actually saying that Robert Byrd was regarded by Hillary Clinton as her political mentor is a bit disingenuous since they're both notorious KKK leaders. They are both what, sorry? Notorious Ku Klux Klan leaders. And Robert Byrd was, Hillary Clinton said it, he was her political mentor and friend. Yeah, I mean. So both candidates in this respect can be targeted, especially since for more Hillary Clinton in the 90s, when speaking about uh, the African American youth, uh, cited the minority of them as super predators. So taking, not showing these aspects, sort of like the media only focusing on Trump and his racism, but f willingly uh, casting aside the, st um, the bad things that Hillary Clinton did in her past. Mm. I think this led also to, his, to Trump's win since this bias sort of further antagonized the people. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two points to draw out of that. The first is that um, you're absolutely right. There is a, there is a, a, a definite critique um, and a powerful critique of um, both Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton during Bill Clinton's time as president of the United States of their racial policies and the impact that they had. That's absolutely true. But the second part of my response to that question is that I don't think that we should um, settle for the mudslinging, Duke versus Bird. You know, these things balance each other out. That is perhaps to see, to see two bits of mud slung as, as balance, whereas Hillary Clinton was the nominee for a party that, you know, has explicit anti-racist um, elements built into its, its political um, plank, its political identity. That's not to say that it's a perf it's perfect party on those questions, um, whereas Trump tapped in during the course of his campaign to these deep veins of... Um, of racism and ethno-nationalism ethno and, 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 and white supremacy, frankly. So I think I, I, I take the point, but I, I, would, I would choose to put a slightly different spin on it, which is that it does matter more with Trump. And when we think about the impact that it's going to have on his policies um, going forward. We're going to take an online question and then the, the lady in front. OK, uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, submitted via Slido. Um, the code is 9431. And Nick, I might send some more of these to you after okay. the event. Um, I'll try and summarize a couple of questions into one. Firstly, about normalizing um, and you know people being surprised that Trump won. The question is, you also mentioned Brexit. Um, what can other countries learn? moving forward, especially European countries like France with imminent elections. Yeah. Um, and a question from me, Michelle Obama, 2020, viable? <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I, think, uh, I think the lesson that we can draw from, from Brexit and from the outcome of this election in relation to kind of polling and our trust of pol polling is, is perhaps not to be so obsessed with polling. Um, you know, and I, for one, am someone who spent a lot of the, lo the, the, the last year, year and a half, reading polling websites, listening to podcasts by pollsters, thinking about the statistic, I mean, I'm no statistician, but thinking about the statistical likelihood of, of, of various different outcomes. And I think there's an extent to which you can say that this has distracted a lot of people in the, the, the pundit class, so-called experts, from talking about the issues, talking about what's really at stake in these elections. Um, and that actually some of those issues have maybe crept up behind us. Um, and so I think it's not to say that, um, that polling and so-called data journalism is, is, is dead, because actually I think it's, it's very useful and helps us, you know, all these exit polls help us dissect what has happened in this election and to explain it. Um, but perhaps we need to be a little bit more skeptical of polls and really sink our teeth into the issues. Um, and that goes to political strategy as well. Michelle Obama 2020, um, I think... I suspect that that's unlikely. I mean, no one really knows, right? But um, my understanding um, of this is that, that she is not um, particularly interested in being a political candidate, especially after having seen how her husband was treated in office. Um, so I'm not sure. And who the, who the next Democratic candidate to be will be is, a, is a, a very tricky question. Thanks. We've got time for a very quick question, if you can, in the front row. As Mr. Trump is the first American to be made president with no experience in government and no military experience, yeah. do you think he'll be able to do the job? <laughs> Quick as you can, please. <laughs> uh, 
That's a, that's a great question uh, and, a, and a good question to end on maybe. I, I think um, there was a point in the campaign where Trump said that um, he was willing to, um, willing to cede both domestic and foreign policy to his vice president, uh, Mike Pence, which begged the question, well, what else is there left, right? Um, I think this might speak to the fact um, that he sees himself um, as a kind of, no. as an executive, but Can not someone who will do the... outside these glass double doors, because there's a lecture going on and there's going to be lots of people coming through. He will do the, uh, he will, he will do the day-to-day, -day, he will do the day-to-day -day work. Um, so I think, I think it's unlikely that Trump will be a kind of roll your sleeves up president, getting down to the very fine detail of, of policy making. Um, I think Mike Pence will have a significant um, influence. Um, Pence is a much more conventional, but nonetheless very conservative Republican figure um, with a very conservative view of, of religion and its impact on politics. Um, so whether he's up to the job or not is a difficult question to answer. There's certainly very little in his background that suggests that he might be. Um, but I think that, that you know, in the, in the way that, 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 that there have been in the past, um, one thinks about the George W. Bush presidency and the Ronald Reagan presidency, um, both presidents who were thought to perhaps not have very much experience, although both of them had much more experience than Donald Trump does. Um, but, you know, the executive is not just one man. You know, that, that one man has, has a considerable amount of influence, but his vice president can have influence. Various other people around him in his office and in his cabinet can have influence. So I, I think up to the job is a difficult question, but the job will get done, and it will be interesting to see who it gets done by. Thank you very much, Nick. Well, then, thank you for your questions. There are a couple of hundred students waiting outside, so unfortunately we do have to move on.